afternoon and welcome to this uh, session 6B of the BEHAVE conference. I am Maria Giovanna Gaglione from Enea and I will be moderate this session. And um, before introducing myself and in introducing the speakers, I just uh, share with you some rules for this conference. Um, you, the audience is muted and uh, moderate and speakers uh, should be muted unless uh, it's uh, their turn to speak. And uh, so for the camera, um, you are kindly requested to, to switch on the camera when it's your turn to talk or in the end uh, when there would be a Q&A session. As I said, at the end of the um, presentation, there will be a Q&A session. So for the audience, be free to write down in the chat your answer. I will gather at the end and uh, uh, we will uh, answer to these questions with the speakers. Um, the, this recording, this uh, session will be recorded, so be free to, and it will be uploaded on the Behave uh, website. So if you miss something, don't worry, you will be, you'll be able to look after on this uh, session. That, Present, introducing myself, uh, as I said, uh, I'm Maria Giovanna Gaglione and uh, uh, I have a Master of Arts uh, in Milan, I took in Milan, and then a Master's degree in the International Development. I joined Enea in the 2011, where I work on national and, and European founded projects in the field of energy efficiency and renewables. Before Enea, I will, I will, I will been working for 10 years for an international human resource company as a business development manager and uh, for some projects uh, for recruiting and training in, uh, in the energy sector. Since uh, 2018, I joined uh, the Behavior Change Working Group of ENR. ENR is the European Energy Network. This uh, behavior group, uh, working group, uh, is uh, chaired by Irmeli Mikonen. And with them, in the last year, we worked uh, on uh, many aspects and also on a catalog of uh, best practices. Uh, this catalog um, shows us a wide range of best practices uh, on behavioral insights in energy efficiency from many different agencies in Europe. And you will find in it also uh, an analysis, um, uh, highlights, uh, conclusions, uh, and some recommendations for consideration. So be free to download this catalog on Behave website. Uh, going back to our session, um, it will be our various researchers we will uh, listen to and I would call a system of stories. We need to tell multiple stories to make a transition to a more sustainable world and engage multiple experiences. That's a complex intellectual ecosystem with multiple objectives. I said complex, not complicated. So it's the time to listen to some of them, to your researchers. I will start and introduce the first with Nicole Watson. Nicole, you can share your screen while I make a little introduction. Okay. okay, Nicole Watson from uh, University College, College of London Energy Institute. She's in the PACE member. PACE um, is P for stands for People, Adaptability, Comfort and Smart Energy. Uh, she was working uh, on a particular focus on energy policy and quantitative research methods. Uh, her research applies experimental methods and uses behavioral economics as a framework for understanding barriers to uptake and new energy suppliers models. In fact, in her work, we will see how she will explore how behavioral mechanisms can engage and empower consumers when they make their energy choices. So the floor is yours, Nicole. 
Thanks very much. Um, so, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, the work that I'm presenting today applies a behavioural economic framework looking at how giving domestic consumers in Great Britain the ability to have more than one energy supplier could affect engagement with local energy. So I'll be talking about findings from two nationally representative survey experiments that we conducted in 2019 in Great Britain. So just for a bit of context, um, so we're beginning to shift away from these centralised fossil fuel powered systems and towards more decentralisation with low carbon generation deployed close to homes and businesses where it will actually be used, as well as harnessing flexibility through smart technologies and behavioural change. So we're also beginning to see lots of new business models that can help accommodate this level of complexity, whilst also empowering consumers. Um, so one of these is local energy. So that's locally owned energy companies that are providing their customers with electricity generated from local, often renewable sources. And these often have some kind of additional social purpose, like addressing fuel poverty. Um, so locally owned energy companies that are providing their customers with electricity generated from local renewable sources. And these often have some kind of social purpose, like addressing fuel poverty or empowering consumers. And in recent years in the UK, our energy regulators and the industry have raised some concerns that the current regulations might be disadvantaging new entrants like these local suppliers, as well as creating regulatory barriers towards innovation. Um, so one of the solutions that's been proposed to this is a multiple supplier model. So we currently have this supplier hub model, which puts energy suppliers really at the heart of the market, and it necessitates that consumers have just one supplier at a time. So in a multiple supply model, by contrast, consumers can just add on this local supply to their current tariff, meaning that they can get a certain percentage of their energy from their local supplier and their current national level supplier meets the rest of their demand. So this enables consumers to begin engaging with some of these more innovative models without actually having to switch away from their current energy supplier. And some of the advocates of this model claim that it can help facilitate some innovation and also give consumers more choice. Um, but some consumer advocacy groups, on the other hand, have begun expressing concerns that the energy market is becoming increasingly complex. And if we're asking people to deal with more and more energy suppliers, then that can decrease engagement. So this study had two main aims. The first one was to understand whether British adults were more likely to engage with local energy in this multiple supply model or the current supplier hub framework that we have right now. And the second was to begin exploring some cognitive biases associated with remaining with default suppliers and looking at how some of these might affect, um, might translate into a multiple supplier context. So we already know that energy market en engagement tends to be quite low. And although rates have been improving over the last few years, just over half of UK consumers didn't engage at all in 2019. And those that do engage do tend to have a preference for switching tariff with the current supplier that they have right now, rather than trying something new. Um, so classic economic theory has one explanation for this. Um, it assumes that we're all rational actors. And when we fail to make choices in line with our best interests, this is because of market failures like transaction costs or not having enough information. But we've seen lots of studies in laboratories and online that show that even when there aren't any barriers to switching and we have all the information we need, um, consumers still tend to stick with the status quo. So instead, I used behavior economics. Um, so this is a theoretical framework that claims, although we try to make rational decisions, we also apply these mental shortcuts known as cognitive biases. So in behavioural economics, the tendency to stay with the status quo is known as the default effect. So the idea that people don't tend to move away from options that are assigned to them. So in the context of energy suppliers, this could be a tariff that they've been automatically enrolled onto, or a contract that they take over when they move into a new house, or maybe just a supplier that they've been with for a really long time. So we know that defaults have really powerful effects, but there's a bit of contention about why. So behavioural economics proposes three mechanisms. The first is cognitive effort. So this is separate from the effort of you know, going online, forgetting your password, switching supplier. It's the actual mental effort of weighing up the different options and forming preferences and making a choice. The second one is implied endorsement. So this is the idea that we stick with defaults because we see them as being recommended to us by the person that chose them. So our supplier puts us on a particular tariff. We assume that our supplier has recommended that tariff to us. Um, the final one is loss aversion. So this is the idea that we evaluate potent, uh, we evaluate decisions against a fixed reference point, which is usually the status quo, and we we emphasise potential losses more than potential gains when we make choices. Um, 
So I argue that these mechanisms have quite important implications for how multiple energy suppliers could affect uptake of local supply. So for instance, if loss aversion plays a really big part in preventing switching to local energy, then being able to just add on a local supplier without having to switch entirely might actually be able to mitigate this and drive the growth of local energy. Whereas if it's a cognitive effort, then the additional complexity of multiple suppliers could increase disengagement. Whereas if it's implied endorsements, then maybe these can be leveraged. So my first experiment had 1,200 participants and it was all pre-registered online. So this was designed to begin untangling some of these cognitive biases and looking at whether multiple suppliers would be socially acceptable. So participants were asked to imagine that they'd received this hypothetical letter from their current energy supplier, who was partnering up with a new local supplier, offering them the chance to just add on their services in what's effectively a multiple supplier model. Participants were randomly assigned to either the single supplier default group, where the status quo was really emphasised, the multiple supply model was seen as this new alternative, and they had to take action if they want to switch to it. Or a multiple supply default group, where they were automatically enrolled onto the multiple supply model and had to take action if they want to switch back. Or an active choice group, where they were both conveyed neutrally and they had to choose between the two. And the default was shown through a pre-tick box um, to try and invoke a sense of transaction costs. So when people were automatically enrolled onto the multiple supply model, the vast majority chose to stick with it. This is quite encouraging because it shows people didn't you know, hate the idea, but it doesn't really say much about whether they'd actively choose to engage. Slightly more strikingly, when they were asked to choose between the two, the vast majority did choose the multiple supply model and the local energy company. So there were no statistically significant differences between these two groups. So that's quite encouraging. Most surprisingly, um, even in the single supplier default group, the majority chose to switch to the multiple supplier model, even those involved actually taking action to engage. So this really strongly suggests that there was an interest in engaging with local energy and multiple supply model, and that this preference was so strong it was able to overcome default effects. Um, there was some follow-up analysis to untangle some of the cognitive biases at work. The evidence was strongest for implied endorsement. There was some evidence for loss aversion, but this kind of went away depending on how I modelled it. So the second experiment looked at whether participants would be more likely to switch to a local supplier under a multiple supplier model or the current supplier hub framework, and also whether multiple suppliers could mitigate loss aversion. So again, participants were asked to imagine they'd received a hypothetical letter. This time it was from a new local energy supplier advertising their services to them. They were randomly assigned to either a single supplier condition, which is the current system we have in the UK right now. So if they want to switch, they have to get rid of their current supplier and go entirely over to this new local supplier. In the multiple supplier condition, they could just add it on, similar to the previous experiment, and their current supplier would act as a backup for filling the rest of their needs. So here the default or the status quo was doing nothing and staying with their current supplier. So the results here were quite different. So in the single supplier conditions, that's what we have in the UK right now, the majority chose to stay with their current supplier and didn't engage with the local energy company. In the multiple supplier condition, um, again, the majority chose to stay with their current supplier, but participants were statistically significantly more likely to engage with the local supplier in the multiple supplier model than the current supplier hub uh, system. And interestingly, loss aversion didn't seem to play any role in this. Um, so just to quickly sum up some of these findings. So participants in the first experiment showed a really high willingness to engage with local energy in multiple supply models, even when they had to actively take action to engage. Um, secondly, they were more likely to engage with local energy suppliers in a multiple supply model where they can add it on versus the current supplier hub framework. So contrary to some of the fears that multiple suppliers would increase disengagement, these seem to suggest that multiple suppliers are actually quite a promising avenue for driving the growth of local energy and innovation in the British retail market. Um, secondly, implied endorsement was the main cognitive bias associated with choosing the multiple supplier model. So this might suggest that we can actually begin leveraging explicit recommendations if these implicit recommendations seem to be having some kind of effect. Um, I should also flag the study wasn't specifically designed to test this, but when we compare the results between the two experiments, we also see that the entity behind the hypothetical letter seemed to have a really big impact on willingness to engage. And they were far more likely to engage when they're approached by their current supplier than this new local supplier that they'd never heard of. So this seems to suggest that actually engaging trusted actions and getting support on board from incumbents will be really crucial in driving local energy forwards. 
Um, so thanks very much for listening. I've had a paper published on this, which is available here, and I've also written a blog post. Um, please feel free to get in touch if anyone wants any more information. Thanks. Thank you, Nicole, for your presentation. It was very clear, very interesting. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. So thank you. So it's a um, Kurt Bizang turn. Uh, Kurt, uh, if you can share, start sharing your screen, I will make a short introduction. Uh, he is head of appliances and competitive tenders section in the energy efficiency and the renewable energy division at the Swiss Federal Office of Energy. And uh, his work is on promoting energy efficiency through competitive tenders and comparing auction schemes to end and end user activation in Germany, Portugal, Switzerland, and Taiwan. So, Kurt, the floor is yours. So, thank you, Maria Tovarna. And um, on behalf of um, the team who I work together for this um, first comparison of tendering schemes for energy efficiency in those four countries. Um, I can give you an introduction. Ten minutes are not so long. I try to focus on two points mainly. Tell you what the idea of tendering energy efficiency is. Then second, um, what are the experiences, who takes part in tenders, who doesn't take part, and what can we do to um, get um, as many um, people involved and save as much energy as possible. And if there's some time, I'm going to share some more insights um, of our comparison. Why competitive tenders for energy efficiency? Um, you can start from a subsidized scheme for energy efficiency, uh, subsidized, which are used in many countries. For example, um, imagine you run an enterprise and you want to renew your lighting system. You're going to invest money for a new lighting system. Um, you take a standard technology, like most people would, and you see that there's the best available technology that saves even more electricity than the standard technology. You're starting to uh, calculate investment costs. Um, you have to take much more money in your hands um, when you invest. You're going to save some money over the lifespan, but uh, mostly best available technologies are still um, also or with the lifespan not having such a good um, um, investment a return on your investment. So um, governments come and say um, uh, we want to promote the best available technology. Um, if you're investing, uh, we cover say 20% of your investment cost. The enterprise wins well, 20%. Okay, my payback is better. Yes, I take it. I, I'm going for the best available technology. And um, with a subsidized scheme, you're going to have um, all enterprises um, to participate in it who, who um, think, uh, well, if I get 20%, then it's good for me. You also get enterprises who participate who, who would say, uh, well, I could do the best available technology if I only get 10% of investment cost as a subsidy. But if they are going to give me 20% of the investment cost, even better, sure, welcome, I'm going to take the money. You always have people who say, I'm going for the best available technology anyway. I need zero subsidy, but I'm taking the subsidy anyway. And you will have those who say, um, if you don't give me half of the costs, I never go for a new technology. So um, that's the idea of subsidies. And now we come with tenders or auctioning. And there we say, Dear enterprise, you can have a subsidy, but um, we don't tell you if it's 20%. Tell us how many, how, how much you need. And um, just uh, we have limited funds. We cannot give the subsidy to anybody. 
we are going to give the subsidy to those people who allow us with the subsidy we have to save as much energy as possible. And then as the owner of the enterprise, you're going to think, well, um, 20%, um, mm, that's, that will be like a default, more or less. Uh, well, I, I only need... I only need 10%. Am I going to ask for 20%? No, I'm going to risk not to get anything at all. Maybe it's better to ask for 10, but I'm willing to take some risk. Maybe I ask for 12%. And you're submitting uh, less. So in a tendering scheme, the government receives offers with um, a varying percentage of the investment cost. In a subsidized scheme, you get um, always um, the same, set by 20%. And um, for the government, this allows you to save money and to have more energy saving for the same amount of subsidies that you can distribute. That's the idea of a competitive tender in energy efficiency. That's a procedure that's usually used. Auctions um, are quite common in renewables. They are not yet as common in energy efficiency. It's a little bit more complicated to define uh, the rules. And um, it's also, um, there's also some questions arising. Um, how can you engage different uh, end user groups? Um, we know from the literature on auctions in renewables, um, auctions compared to outer subsidy schemes, they um, they led to an overrepresentation of big enterprises. Um, is it the same case uh, with energy efficiency or not? So um, um, we are fear for people from the different countries who um, in one way or another work um, on these schemes or um, studied them and um, brought together um, some qualitative um, insights. And I will not be able to present you all um, those things about the countries and go straight to the comparison. Um, here with uh, focus, focusing on uh, what do we see with who participates in uh, such a scheme. And um, uh, you find this here in the line scope of sellers. It's mainly um, companies who have um, an installation they are going to replace and either subsidize. But it's also um, intermediaries who bundle measures for maybe small enterprises, small and medium enterprises. Or an interesting thing I think is uh, can also uh, focus on ESCOs in Portugal, um, Germany and Taiwan. And um, Taiwan is an example where only ESCO can participate. And um, it's also a measure that tries to tries that um, ESCOs start to develop resources and competencies in their company for energy efficiency consultancy. So um, it's possible to, um, to have different goals um, at the same time. And the experiences we find um, with regards to the participation, it's mostly industry and manufacturing, sometimes households. Um, some findings um, that are not so surprising, large private and public enterprises are still clearly overrepresented. They are even overrepresented in um, the cases where you use intermediaries. There's always um, also a possibility for them to participate there. Um, it can be used for different target groups and, and purposes, but um, it's a challenge to use it as an instrument that can trigger energy efficiency measures also in medium and smaller enterprises. 
and the measure that uh, have been taken in the different countries in order to promote more uh, participation are um, in many cases similar. Uh, one is um, communication and marketing of the tendering scheme. People have to know that it exists and um, how to enter it. It's um, very um, important to simplify and speed up the application procedure so people don't have to wait long for an answer and um, they don't have to fill in an enormous um, amount of of paper. Um, nevertheless, even if you do that, if you really also want to include households and small enterprises, you probably have to um, organize a separate tender for a specific target group um, to um, to allow them to participate. So uh, one of the challenges that is remaining is um, still um, how can we activate energy efficiency measures in small and medium enterprises also with um, subsidized scheme through um, energy efficiency tenders? Um, well, that's also an open question, maybe for the discussion. And um, um, I um, use the time for some broader conclu conclusions for the instruments in general. Um, it's uh, competitive tenders are robust. You can use them for all kinds of things, for a wide scope of different target groups and technologies. They can deliver energy savings and at a low cost. Um, it's maybe, um, it's, it's really, I would say it's really well suited for specifically designed technical solutions, but um, you can also uh, use it for others. Um, there are still, you cannot avoid um, that um, if you have a competition and people participate, they have an uncertainty. They are not sure that they get a subsidy. And that's just a part of the instrument. You cannot avoid it. And you will have always people who don't participate because they don't like uncertainty or the, the uncertainty doesn't fit into their business plan of um, planning um, the renewal of an uh, installation. And uh, we also see um, we have countries where you have 10 or 12 years um, and it's still working. So um, it's a thing maybe um, you um, a thing I always like to promote. I um, hope you um, feel it's interesting too, but it's a challenge yes, that it remains. Was, uh... Uh, how can <laughs> we get the small and medium enterprises in it? Thank yes, you. thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. And maybe, maybe there will be questions at the end to um, underline some issues that you mentioned. So uh, let's go to our third presenter. That's uh, Spiros Shimenos. That um, I make a little presentation while Begonia will help me in uh, um, playing his video. As I said, he's in Australia, he cannot uh, uh, join uh, live this meeting. Uh, Spiros, uh, he is working, is a currently a PhD fellow and research assistant of the Humanitarian and Development Research Initiative at School of Social Sciences in Western Sydney University. Uh, his uh, study was uh, on his on energy availability in remote communities, and uh, he considered this energy availability as a key element for sustainable development and also to prevent disasters. So, Begonia, if you want to start the video, thank you. Hello everyone, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present here today. My name is Paris Hismenos, and I represent Western Sydney University in Australia. My research is in humanitarian engineering, and my topic is uh, in uh, off-grid hydropower for community flood resilience. 
Before I start, I would like to express our sincere apologies for not being able to be there. However, due to the time difference between Sydney and Europe, this was not an option. So please accept our apologies. A few words about us. Humanitarian and Development Research Initiative is a group of researchers, academics, policymakers, and other stakeholders, not just in Australia, but also overseas. We focus on three main research areas, disaster preparedness, response and management, migration diaspora, sustainable development and human security. Our current project in humanitarian engineering involves two more universities, International Hellenic University in Greece, together with their UNESCO chair, and Kathmandu University in Nepal. We also collaborate with two communities. One is in Greece, in Agitis River, and the other one is in Nepal, in Sunkosi River. As you can see from the photos, these two communities are very different uh, to each other. One is in a high-income country, the other one is in a low-income country. The reason we decided to include both of them is because we want to investigate the different perceptions in energy and flood response matters. I will start explaining more about our research by asking you the question you see on your screen. It's 2 a.m., you're sleeping, and a flash flood hits your home. Without a warning system, what do you do? Energy, as you know, is very important, not just for the development of a community, but also for their resilience against natural hazards. Just imagine that you are in your own house, it's late at night, and there is a blackout, and suddenly your house starts flooding. What can you do? How can you evacuate? This situation is very difficult, and imagine how worse it is for communities with limited capabilities, for communities with unreliable energy and low or no early warning systems. However, how can we define vulnerable communities? What are their exact characteristics? According to our research findings, these communities are usually small, rural, remote, they have low income, they are mono economies, they live by the river, they have power insufficiency, high flood risk, poor disaster resilience and poor telecommunications. It makes sense to say that the more of these characteristics they have, the more vulnerable they are. So what can we do to increase the capabilities of vulnerable communities? Our research suggests the combination of three elements. The first is early warning systems. If we install early warning systems, the communities will be aware of any upcoming disaster and they can evacuate safely. The second one is energy. Due to their location, usually such communities are in remote areas, so we cannot link them to main energy grids. Therefore, off-grid hydropower generators or solar panels are more appropriate for them. The third element is to prioritize the community's needs. And what do I mean by that? We, as humanitarian engineers, value a lot the capabilities and needs of vulnerable communities. So, for example, if a community needs a small-scale hydropower generator that can generate up to 300 watt, the communities should be able to decide how they want to spend this amount of energy. It could be in public lights. It could be in pumping for agricultural activities. This concept of three elements accords with the principles of sustainable development goals and Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. In practice, together with the other two universities and the two communities, we're in the process of developing a prototype. The prototype is a small-scale hydropower generator that is linked with early warning systems. Under normal conditions, the system can generate an amount of energy. This energy can be spent, as we mentioned before, in communities' needs. During extreme conditions, the system can activate emergency lights and sirens, so people can evacuate quickly. Unfortunately, due to the COVID restrictions, we were not able to get an actual video footage, so I can show you how the prototype works. 
I hope this visual example can help you understand. The first thing that we have to do is to run the flood risk estimations. We need to know which areas are about to flood first and which locations in the river will continue to have sustainable water flow so the hydropower generator will continue to work even during flood conditions. As we mentioned earlier, once we install the system, the community will decide how they want to spend their energy. In this example, they want to spend it in house lights. Together with disaster management professionals, we teach the communities how to evacuate, how to install early warning systems, and how to do an evacuation drill so they will be prepared when a disaster is about to come. When the system detects changes in water levels, it will send warnings to nearby populations. This way, people will be aware that a flood is possible so they can be prepared for an evacuation. When the water level reaches critical thresholds, the system will send a warning to the people that evacuation is immediate. Note here that the energy delivery changes and from the residences goes directly to emergency lights and sirens and possibly to a shelter. The prototype can work under variations. For example, instead of a hydro unit, we can have solar panels or a wind turbine. What is important is for the system to have six features. The first is workability. We want the system to be able to work under both normal and extreme conditions. The second one is adaptability. We want the system to be able to operate in different communities of similar atmospheric and hydrogeomorphological conditions. We want it to be portable and also we want the local end users to be able to assemble, disassemble, repair and maintain it themselves. That means that the system should have the feature of DIY and EDO. This stands for do it yourself and easy to deploy and operate. Also, we want the community to engage since the early stages of the, the project. And because the financial capability of the end users is usually low, we want the system to be able to made by recycled materials or locally available materials. This was my presentation. Uh, I would also like to say that we are in talks with other communities in uh, South Korea, Nepal, Brazil, Guatemala. You can see some of our work featured on Prevention Web. If you have any questions or any ideas for collaboration, feel free to email me. And you can also check our website for more projects or works. You can also follow us on social media. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a good rest of the conference. Thank you, Spiros. We appreciated uh, his holistic and analytic approach for systems that address local needs. It's very interesting. And uh, now let's go swiftly to Nicola Renisio. Uh, Nicola, if you are ready, uh, make a short yes. introduction while you are sharing your screen. Yes, thanks. Okay. He's an adjunct professor in social psychology at University of Milan and in the Department of Cultural Heritage and Environment. He conducts studies on the relationship between psychological well-being and places and has participated in several projects funded by research grants from national and international institutions. His work is a micro-scale analysis of attitudes and behaviors towards sustainability and domestic energy saving in Italy. With in collaboration with the Lab of Communication Tools of NEA, and uh, the, the floor is yours, Nicola. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I will quickly present the results uh, of an explorative research uh, that I developed together with Pauline Guilleri, Marco Boffi, and Linda Pola, colleagues at the University of Milan. Uh, it's a, a, a social psychology group. And uh, together with the colleagues Ilaria Sergi and Maura Liberatori from Enea. 
uh, this project was born as a part of the campaign Italy in Class A. And uh, uh, this campaign is uh, promoted by the Italian Ministry for Economic Development and uh, Dominion. And our, uh, our work was aimed to test a new policy approach for the Italian context, an approach focused on identifying the main psychosocial factors that are able to trigger virtuous uh, energy saving behaviors on a domestic micro scale. As we uh, discussed in our first conjoint report, uh, the cover is visible here. Uh, the Italian scientific approach to energy saving was until now uh, mainly focused on engineering or on economics, so on economical aspects, with uh, uh, an insufficient consideration of the psychosocial and the cultural factors. Uh, in fact, uh, we found very few studies on the psychological determinants of sustainability in general and of energy consumption behaviors focused on the Italian context. Especially focused on, uh, we have very few studies uh, focused on the domestic scale. Uh, on the other end, in this same review, uh, we detected the uh, a very contradictory social uh, scenario uh, because uh, the Italians in general show uh, show in the in the review so in the in the published researches uh, shows uh, at the same time a strong concern for sustainability and energy saving issues so they are concerned about they are also worried about but they have a very weak tendency to behavioral change. Uh, in psychological terms, uh, uh, Italians are mainly focused on uh, an external locus of control, as they tend to attribute the responsibility of the, of the current ecological situation to external causes uh, and not to their own behavior too. Uh, so they are externalizing the causes of the, of the, um, the climate change, but also the, the, the responsibility of the climate change, and they also show a moderate level of productivity if compared with other European citizens. So uh, according to uh, this specific framework, we uh, designed this explorative study uh, to uh, analyze uh, the relationship between energy saving attitudes and behaviors on a domestic micro scale with a specific focus on the Italian scenario. Uh, we involved uh, 155 participants and we uh, designed two different surveys. One was dedicated to the individuals and the other one was dedicated to, uh, to the families. Uh, of course, the, um, the, the complete report uh, is available online, so you can download it. It's in Italian, but you can download it at this, at this link. And uh, today I will report very quickly the, some main results because of course it was explorative. So we had a lot of things, uh, we, we had a lot of results to talk about, but uh, I, I won't just highlight some, for, uh, some, some results. Uh, the first one is that uh, uh, there's no significant age gap on domestic energy saving attitudes, but very different frameworks. Uh, so we discovered that uh, domestic saving, uh, energy saving attitudes are uh, intergenerational in Italy, but uh, so the intensity of the, uh, the relevance that was attributed to energy saving is uh, uh, intergenerational, but uh, um, when we compare uh, in general, when we compare the younger and the older age groups, we may easily see that they have the same level of attention to energy saving, but the, uh, this is for completely different reasons, uh, because the young people have an, an ideological approach to sustainability, as the seniors are mainly motivated because of money saving. You can see it in, in this chart. So if you ask them, uh, uh, if they are careful uh, to reduce uh, uh, 
consumption to save money, uh, there's there's a significant difference in power of the of the uh, older people. But if you uh, ask them to, uh, if the consumption affects their environmental sustainability, you you can see that the reaction is completely different, and there's a, a significant difference in power of the younger people. Uh, the second the second main result uh, is that uh, as was recognized in literature, we also detected a gender gap in energy saving behaviors in favor of the female participants. But we discovered that this gap is not linked with main differences in the attitude toward energy saving itself, but uh, it's linked with uh, uh, different perception of domain specific perceived self self efficacy. For instance, in the perception of being able to be an example for the others or of being able to contribute to sustainability. Um, Another point is that we discovered a gap between highly sustainable families, those that show a greater attitude towards sustainability, and the other families in the number of household electric devices as the former one. So the highly sustainable families, uh, compare, comparing the same family sizes, have a significantly lower number of devices. Uh, the same effect was detected in the comparison between condos, uh, so apartments, and independent homes. As the condo residents uh, declared to have a smaller number of electric devices than the others. Uh, now, just to conclude, just a few words on the main policy implications of these results. Uh, the first point is that it seems to be very important to targeting the different social groups we detected. So in social communication, uh, taking into account uh, the age, gender, and dwelling differences. So the idea is to try to, is, is to start to avoid the mainstream advertising in favor of specific forms of communication that will be able to recognize the existence of different energy subcultures. Uh, another point is to invest on promoting domain-specific self-efficacy. It means to uh, invest on immediate feedbacks that can make people be easily aware of the direct impact of their domestic actions. Uh, as a third point, uh, another point is to focus uh, not only on the consumption, but also on inputs, on the family purchasing choices. Uh, as we saw that also this aspect is linked with uh, different target groups. Uh, the final tip is uh, 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 that uh, a focus on involving specific social groups like uh, women and highly sustainable families is uh, needed to better promote uh, behavioral change at a micro at micro scale level. Uh, thank you. I will be available later for the questions. This is the these are the websites, and that's all I guess. Thank you, Nicola, very much. It is true in Italy we have. Um, um, spread of sustainable behaviors, uh, uh, including energy saving, is lower than uh, other European uh, average. So this uh, finding in uh, including uh, these uh, target groups uh, with uh, um, as a gatekeeper to energy transition is very interesting. Okay, now let's go to uh, Kaisa Machos. Kaisa. Did I pronounce your name right? <laughs> Very good. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So uh, I make a short presentation while you can start sharing your presentation. Uh, she's adjunct professor at the University of Eastern Finland, works as a university researcher at the Consumer Society Research Center, a University of Helsinki. 
Her research interests lie, lie in the fields of sustainable energy, innovations, and public engagement. The work she's presenting is on learning from failures as a support for an energy transition. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yes, um, yes. my name is Kaja Matas and I come from Helsinki. Thank you very much. Um, the, um, I would like to thank my co-authors, Jenni Happonen, Eva Heeskan and Irmeli Mikkonen first. I see some of them are in the audience, so uh, they can participate in the question and answers. Um, section. The background to the study that I'm presenting is um, is in kind of twofold. Um, it was enabled by a smart energy transition project that has in one of the, its work packages an objective to learn from experimentation. And then another background is uh, um, Hesek University's project course that was organized for um, master's students of an environmental change and global sustainability. Um, students and um, they have a challenge in this project course um, that they asked to search solutions for and that year that we organized this um, this course these students had to had to find a solution to question how to promote learning and collaboration within energy pilots and experiments ongoing in Finland um, and why this question um, and why this um, question about learning from failures is that local learning through small scale experimentation plays a role in the process through which technologies are mainstreamed. And uh, su successful outcomes often overshadow the efforts and difficulties in, in reaching them. But still, failed experiments could deliver us even more important results than the successful ones, but um, they do not necessarily enhance the confidence or commitment of the participants, so they do not talk about these experiences so much. So lessons that are learned concerning the problems and uh, challenges and missing competencies, they would need to be shared more. So um, we found that there is a problem related to interaction between experiments. So Experiments are being made, but there is not much uh, interaction between them. So therefore, there is not so much collective learning and there is no community around these uh, experiments. Um, we also found that when experimentation, per definition, has the opportunity for people also to fail, but these failures are not often shared. And reasons are many, but uh, for instance, if the failures are your own, then you kind of have the fear of losing your authority. You maybe feel ashamed. You also kind of can lose motivation altogether. And that's why you don't really much like to talk about the failures. Um, and if these failures are from other people, then there is this um, kind of trade off of finding guilty parties versus sweeping under the rug. And um, Especially in Finland, which is a very small country, you kind of know that eventually you will meet these people again and you have to kind of collaborate with them possibly in the future. So kind of uh, confronting the failed parties is also very difficult. So you don't want to offend anybody. And kind of do these, uh, to do these reasons, uh, talking about failures is kind of a taboo. And there is also this kind of a culture, I don't need help in, in Finland. And there is a third problem that relates to a cognitive bias. So concentrating on, on the people or things that survived or, or were successful. Um, typically, um, because of you don't see the failed ones, that can lead to distorted conclusions in several different ways and can lead also to this very optimistic belief that yeah, if I just try hard enough and I can success in everything. So um, these are the problems if failures are not really talked about. Mm. So these students came up with the solution that um, you could talk about failures in a um, surrounding which would be really um, relaxed. So it might be easier for these people. So 
because we had this project, we had the possibility to hire one of the students. She is on the right hand side in this slide back turned to us uh, to organize um, kind of energy experiments after work events. That would be a place where these learnings can be shared and it would be a very relaxed um, atmosphere in these events. So um, we ended up organizing the six um, uh, events in five different small towns in Finland, but yeah, Helsinki is a city, but still a small town compared to the European uh, average. Um, we had all together 139 participants, and these events all took place in a similar manner. So first we talked about failures and analyzed the problem, why failure, what was the reaction to the failure, did learning take place, and what could be the benefits from the learnings and what are the most important learnings, how to spread them out. We um, had facilitators in the tables where these, um, the discussions took place, but we didn't record them. So in, just to ensure that these, these, uh, the atmosphere will remain kind of relaxed. So the goals were um, information and skills exchange between the experimenters. We wanted to uh, support also the creation of energy and climate experimenters network. And we wanted them to share, share their learnings from failures and challenges and kind of learn ourselves about from those failures. So what skills are needed to deploy the new technologies? What supportive systems are potentially lacking? What problems do users encounter when, when they use these new kind of technologies? And what um, unanticipated consequences do these new technologies have? So the idea was kind of share the spread the culture of experimentation and promote a culture of kind of fail safe thing so so that it would be okay to talk about failures as well um, when we analyzed the the material that we got from these events uh, we looked at learnings I'm not going to go into the detail uh, of those uh, theories but we um, looked at learnings from the failures and we could see that there are many ways to understand the failure. It's basically the deviation from expected results, but there are preventable failures that kind of um, are deviations from operational guidelines and routine processes. Then there are complex failures which are uh, emerged due to the unpredictability of complex systems. And then there are intelligent failures which um, kind of are produced by learning through trial and error. Um, I will not go into our findings, but you can see we had different kinds of uh, um, types of failures that are can be allocated to preventable failures and challenges, like improving the flow of information, uh, technical deficiencies in system installations, and adapting uh, new technologies to its operational environment. Then when we look at the complexity aspect, we found challenges related to market underdevelopment and uh, to co-development. Then there was a conflict between sellers' promises and customers' expectations, and also in communication and uh, interaction. And then we, when we look at the context and institutional setting, uh, then we found out there are challenges and problems related to permits and locations of pro projects and then other challenges such as recycling or construction and supply and so on. So I'll just conclude. Um, we found that this kind of uh, uh, energy experiment as after work events could reinforce both social learning and peer learning of participants. And these, this took place due through very concrete observations about technologies and uh, Pilot, pilot projects. The events highlighted the need to improve the flow of information, pay attention to the quality of the technical installation of the systems, and also help to adapt the new technology to the operating environment. Um, we also think that the concept of this event and the theme of learning from failures does have a place in disseminating the lessons of local experiments and increasing the collaboration of experimenters 
and that's also in promoting the energy transition more broadly. And uh, the discussions uh, or discussing failures highlighted the importance of the context of experiments as well as the competence of the actors. So I will just conclude with uh, Thomas Edison's word, I have not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. So thank you very much. I will stop sharing. Thank you, thank you, Kaisa, very much. It was a very brave approach because uh, admitting failures is not easy. Sharing failures is more difficult. And uh, I found that uh, the communication strategy that you used was appropriate to create openness and trust. And uh, maybe uh, this can this experiment can be replicated in other contexts and they will be very useful for broader learning. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, now I introduce the last presenter. Okay. Do you see my screen? Elena, Elena, yes. Hi. Uh, you are here. Elena, um, just Malak. Malatka, is Malaka. it correct? Malatka, okay. <laughs> She's a researcher in the, um, she works in the Department of Energy Technology uh, in Sweden. And um, she currently researches around the application of big data in smart buildings and explores new ways of rethinking and representative data in the field. And uh, her work is uh, very original, is uh, identification everyday food related behavior patterns. And it was very, uh, in this period of pandemic, it was very important to see these uh, findings. Okay, it's, uh, the floor is yours, Elena. Thank you so much. So, uh, do you see well my screen? Yes. And we start here. So, and as you said, just second before, uh, during the pandemic, the study about food-related behavior gets very, very important because mostly we found that uh, we cook way more at home and we didn't really objectively understood how much energy we use for the food-related behavior because we mostly ate outside for lunches, we had different meetings with friends outside, so we, we kind of didn't have a clear system boundaries for food-related behavior. And now when people were locked in their homes, they in, like increased their cooking kind of time and food related behavior significantly. If you see uh, before OECD published number like two to 7% total energy electricity coming to cooking. Now it's uh, might be up to 15, 20%. So, and of course it's depending on the customer segment, but it is a huge shift. And I think we need to really be very uh, clear about having strategies for this kind of situation. Uh, so, study scope. Uh, of course, it's exportive study, and it actually started before uh, the pandemic. It started as a study about service design for build environment, and one of the topic priority was uh, sustainable food. And we already started before pandemic research how we can explore individual food, uh, individual uh, food related habits patterns. And a uh, study was conducted at uh, KTH Living Lab testbed, uh, which is a multiple uh, testbed for innovation within clean tech, in real estate and buildings. And I specifically work with a building with 300 apartments, um, which is passive laboratory. And we also have four apartments for active laboratory, which is actually a uh, playground for um, pretty intensive research studies. And this is space packed with sensors and different uh, tech stuff. So uh, talking about research methodology, uh, definitely uh, you can't start such study with a big group of people because you work on individual level. Uh, we mostly use um, 300 apartments for uh, just uh, quality of data analysis and persona making because we wanted to understand how end users actually um, just perceive food related habits. But then once we get this understanding, we represent personas uh, in our uh, active laboratory, which was packed with sensors. And we started to collect mostly qualitative data uh, combined with feedback loop data, which is qu uh, qu qualitative and quantity from sensors. And that started to become an iterative process. But initially, we didn't plan to research in direct energy. So we mostly uh, kind of thought about direct energy uh, research. But then when we get the first feedback loop from end users, 
uh, they ask us, okay, well, everything is nice, but it's not enough for us to see kilowatt hours per oven or per meal or per day. We need a broader understanding of uh, food-related habits. That's where we moved to um, to indirect energy usage uh, theory development and how we can do it. And of course, the final stage is kind of come back to these 200 departments and get their feedback on the quality of our research outcomes and start to plan some kind of policy prescriptions and future policy evaluation when it's uh, start to be implemented. But let's talk about system boundaries. We start with individuals. It is a human-centric uh, approach in the study, and we start with individuals analyzing their activities, preferences, psychological, and emotional signals. Then, of course, we analyze kitchen uh, as a system too, mostly home appliances and their electricity uh, consumption. And of course, uh, kitchen is part of the apartment, and we uh, indirectly use systems like ventilation and lightning while we're doing cooking activities. So it is important to add this layer uh, to, to build as holistic as possible system. And of course, food somehow come to our uh, life, to our apartments, and that's where we include uh, grocery stores, markets, and cafes uh, as a food supply kind of chain. And um, we started with personas. We started to understand, okay, how we can start to classify this broader uh, group of people to some kind of uh, behavioral pattern categories. And we easily found five categories, four of them were represented at our four apartments. Uh, busy students who have never time to cook or to be environmental, um, don't matter people who just, just they don't matter about uh, what they eat and when they eat and so on. Uh, gourmet people who really care about uh, food culture and they want to explore more. Veggie people, very pro-environmental cluster um, and athletes. A lot of students in our campus, they are really keen on sports and they also have specific approach to food. And from this, we started to move to uh, understanding, okay, how we can really uh, start to understand this uh, behavioral patterns. And most of the studies um, in this field, they focus on direct energy in the household, which not always cover this trade parts and waste parts. In this presentation, I don't present waste, but we did a big study on waste. And the um, idea was to start to create feedback loop between uh, researchers and uh, tenants to build this um, holistic approach and build a framework which they would like to get information about. So that's how we include trade and specifically acquisition. And of course, indirectly, we also add um, uh, some analysis of uh, all fractions, um, all stages of food preparation, like from production, processing, packaging, because when you buy something in the shop, you kind of need to understand, okay, where it was produced, how it was processed, and how it was packed. So that's kind of the picture of the um, kind of um, supply chain from the point of individual perspective. And data-wise, um, I can say we had pretty a lot. It is an uh, experiment which was conducted for one full month, 30 days of every day um, monitoring of this uh, for students. Uh, for trade data, we analyze bills and, and we get a lot of information, country of origin and type of package, type of storage and so on. Of course, household data is the most classical, it's most electricity, water. Plus, we add food uh, pictures to see the context and see the portions and to see kind of this, make this foodstagram. And we also uh, collect data from beans. Uh, mostly, we had uh, weight of all waste fractions, including um, uh, food waste. And we also collected pretty a lot of individual data, uh, like qualitative daily surveys and quantitative device-based data, just in case if we need to, if we have some anomalies, how we can see it from the activity rate or sleeping rate. So it, it's actually pretty broad uh, data uh, framework, which gave us a few really good results uh, from the point of food-related activities. So if you can see acquisition, delivery, cooking, eating, storing, cleaning, and packaging, each of this um, kind of activity has its own energy label uh, translated to kilowatts. So most of the data from acquisition, which were normally presented in CO2 um, capacity, so we translate to uh, um, kilowatt hours to have some kind of understanding what is high, what is medium, and what is low. And interesting that you can easily see that even if some uh, personas have very similar patterns like gourmet and athlete, they have completely different motivation why they overconsume specific uh, amounts of energy. And also, if you look at the busy persona, which is most of the people uh, working with IT and uh, engineering, they don't eat at home. 
What means that we normally don't have their data about direct energy use. What means that they actually they still consume a lot of energy for food-related habits, but not at home. And this kind of showed us this uh, bias um, of average, uh, make an average uh, picture of all individuals. So uh, very briefly, I will just highlight that after this understanding, we start to design behavioral strategies for each persona. Uh, I will just highlight mostly like cooking related, uh, which were two main strategies, low energy cooking recipes. We developed around 25 uh, recipes, which shows how, mu how many kilowatts you use per different meal. For example, pizza, uh, sorry, lasagna is twice more energy consuming than uh, pasta. And then, of course, it's uh, analyzing of leftovers because, because students in Sweden and also international students who come here, they build this habit of using leftovers. But these students, they didn't use it. And that's where it was our suggestion for them how they can do it. So in talking about some potential energy saving, I didn't put uh, kilowatts here, not to confuse you with too many numbers, but you can easily see that Direct energy, of course, it is a uh, dominant, but still indirect energy, it is a pretty big fraction. And if end users are aware about this uh, division, they might really change their behavioral, not on the kitchen, but in the store. That's kind of one of the main outcomes that a lot of decisions might be done way earlier and a lot of nudging mechanisms might be applied way earlier. And of course, if we scale this persona, through this persona methodology, we can scale for the old building. It's pretty uh, also big numbers with um, correlation uh, for the like don't care people and so on. And uh, last slide about policy uh, prescriptions. Of course, we're all aware about this uh, bath to uh, policy making where we come from macro level to micro level. But our main feedback that we need to focus on master level of organizations where we can do a huge job to put labels and to do innovation related to trade process and really redesign our um, kind of buying habits. And then, of course, move uh, created with uh, housing design, but not building, but more like housing infrastructure, which are which is like home appliances, furniture, and so on. Uh, in this project, we work with a company called Electrolux, and Electrolux globally have one billion customers. And if we apply at least to 10% of their customers, some innovation related to uh, adding this kind of nudging mechanism and additional assistance services, we can reach pretty impressive numbers in saving energy in all ways. Okay, I'm finishing here. I know I'm out of time. I will just finish with my favorite quote from Don Norman. We must design for the way people behave, not how we would wish them to behave. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Elena. It was very interesting. As I said myself, I found cooking on a daily basis since the pandemic. So the first question is for you, from it's my curiosity. Uh, which strategies for direct and direct energy savings in food-related energy behavior do you envisage after these findings? First of all, uh, it's important to specify that we focus on students and a specific category of people. Yeah. But uh, general idea that if you get more understanding on uh, ingredients and uh, your recipes, that's kind of can shift it a lot. In our case, when we did this recipe strategy, when we tested it, and it was almost 50%, 40 to 50%, just because you understand how much energy you need per dish. For example, as I said, example, lasagna and pasta. When you decide it's for you, just a nice Italian food. But when you understand energy consumption, it's about direct energy. Uh, it's actually uh, showing that it's tremendous difference. So it means this kind of feedback uh, loops, which I think should be organized by home appliances companies. You don't need to kind of do this extra up or extra work for it. But if you get this understanding and in integrate it into the design of the products, uh, uh, that could bring a lot of kind of um, savings for them direct energy. So that's about like recipe strategy. Uh, talking about indirect energy, definitely we found that shopping process is very unsustainable from the point of nudging people to right way. We don't nudge people in the shop, we nudge them on the kitchen. And it's too late because if you already bought a lot of uh, food, you might be it's too late to nudge you, right? Uh, what means that we need to redefine the strategies, how we design our shops, how we prioritize zonings, how we do marketing, how we can make green marketing. 
and really aggressively push this kind of not just labeling, not small little green label on the product, but really work with a store management holistically. And that's what I think uh, for EU strategies might be interesting to apply, how we can um, come to the closer to decision-making uh, stage, which is shop, and really nudge people uh, and nudge uh, and motivate uh, stores to design their approaches. So that's kind of two biggest outcomes which came, and uh, especially when we analyze Bill's data, uh, there are a lot of data in the stores, like country of origin, type of storing, uh, type of packaging, which is not highlighted. And when we showed it to our uh, tenants, they were like, wow, we never knew this. Like Philadelphia cheese is the most unsustainable product in the store because everyone likes it. And you don't have uh, knowledge about processed uh, kind of type, package uh, um, type, uh, and so on and so on. So it means it's a lot of hidden data about uh, environmental impact of our food. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I go through the questions in the chat. If all the speakers can uh, switch on the camera so we can make a more interactive uh, session. Uh, there was a, a question for Kaisa, if, if I'm not wrong. Just, uh, yes, from Catherine. Uh, she said that uh, this study connects with the previous work system of stories, also on rejection, which is different than failure. And uh, um, the question is, uh, is studying failure a different kind of research? Mm. Um, yeah, I saw her comment previously. I've been wondering the last 20 minutes whether it is or not. Um, you uh, although, yeah, yeah, could be or not, because um, I could see that it is just a question among others. But on the other hand, you kind of rely on the people who have failed to share their experiences. Like you kind of need to approach this also, uh, whether these people are willing to talk about the failure or not. Um, Catherine also um, attached her article or the, the reference to her article article and I could see that there are very similarities because in, in her article she talks about kind of learning stories which I also think that they are kind of related to the uh, failure stories that we have studied so I, I agree with her and I was thinking that there is also kind of um, a perspective of expectations so who's from whose point of view are these lessons then learned and what kinds of learnings are there and what kind of um, who decides whether it is a success case or a failure. So people have different kinds of expectations when they go to experimentation. So this is also one thing to consider about. Okay, thank you. And there was also another question from Catherine. I think it was also uh, for, for you. Uh, I like the clustering of groups and practices rather than focus on the average. Did the people fit easily into one of these four groups or were there some or were outliers? That, that was the question for Elena, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I can actually, uh, it's really, it was a painful process to accept persona methodology for data scientists. Um, but I found very interesting uh, insight that actually when you uh, build these bigger clusters, uh, you first kind of, okay, maybe they're, they're not the same, as homogeneous as you think. That's why you normally build these subclusters then. And then where you interpolate them kind of this bias. Because, for example, in the Vigi cluster, it was very, very similar behavioral patterns. There are no kind of subclusters besides vegan and vegetarian. Rather than like in the uh, gourmet cluster, it was a big diversity of subclusters. But what it gave us, it gave us this first iteration on, on how we can personalize um, these uh, behavioral insights towards individual preferences. Because as I show you, like the person who is like computer scientist, um, uh, busy person uh, and uh, gourmet, they had this pretty the same numbers, but the motivation is that it's very different. So it means that we can start with these four groups, but it's very important to continue go to subclusters until you have 
pretty clear picture of uh, how it's distributed within like one cluster. And I also like, I study a lot, uh, like with, not study, we did a lot of workshops with Google Home where I really get this mindset of really coming as close as possible to this individualization. Even if it's then difficult to scale, it's still possible. And the world of uh, like big tech showing that you can come pretty close and zoom in, zoom out to different customer segments. But if you practice this, you might gain a lot of interesting insights, which you would never gain if you just make this average line, number of people, average uh, consumption. I, I stop believing in this approach. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Elena. I have a question for Nicole. Um, as a result, implied endorsement was the most robust behavior mechanism in consumers' choices for a multiple supplier. So do you think is this the right path to approach future suppliers' models from a behavior perspective? Yeah, so I think um, it kind of suggests that these sort of perceived recommendations have, have played a role. Um, and then that seems to imply that you could then use explicit recommendations. But I think there's something quite interesting in here around trust. So, um, for example, the other findings showed that people are far more likely to switch if they were approached by their current supplier rather than this new unknown supplier. And I think there's there's got to be something in here around engaging actors that people trust and have a relationship with. And, yeah, there's kind of a question about whether we actually trust our energy suppliers. But, um, yeah, so I think. I wouldn't really say that any one rec mechanism is sort of the right path to go down or the sort of catch-all solution, but I think it, it's something definitely worth exploring. Okay, thank you. Um, a question for Nicola, uh, it, because it was very interesting to see that um, the social group had a uh, high awareness of energy sustainability and uh, how they can be engaged to endorse uh, the ecologic transition to the rest of the community. How can uh, their uh, behavior can influence other occupants? In which way? Um, I, I guess that the best way to engage them is to engage them, I would say, in a in direct, indirect way, uh, because I was thinking that uh, we have a lot of interesting psychological studies on how descriptive norms could be more useful than the injuncting norms in fostering uh, behavioral change. So I think they can be part of uh, something like uh, a comparative system at the micro scale. For instance, uh, could be compared. It could be a comparative system in the condos, the department, or in the in a, in a specific neighbor. A, a, a comparison between neighborhood uh, residents. Uh, I have in mind, uh, uh, for instance, uh, energy smart bills uh, with a direct and uh, possibly also a real time comparison between neighbors or uh, between other other categories. Uh, a good uh, a good uh, example could be inside an office or uh, inside a company, uh, for instance. Uh, perhaps it could be also useful to introduce some forms of rewarding uh, for the most virtuous participants. So I guess that in general is better to to not to not involve them like testimonials, but to make them uh, they naturally work uh, inside their social context. Uh, it, they, they could inspire the others uh, uh, by social comparison and not by uh, uh, playing the role of uh, of a formal uh, playing the role of a formal tes uh, tes testimonial that is uh, let's say more uh, more unnatural. It's it's uh, distant distant from the real life. Okay, thank you very much. There is uh, another question for Elena. Did the study look into estimating the potential energy savings uh, from different types of nudging? I don't know if you already mentioned this. No, <laughs> and I can tell you why. Uh, it was a um, pretty conscious decision when 
We have a, a group of uh, researchers working mostly with nudging, uh, ethical nudging, uh, like uh, different like different types of nudging. And uh, after speaking with them, I decided that um, nudging should be, for me, in my personal view, it should be something what should come later because it is a big responsibility when you interact with someone and push someone towards something. And I decided that I will apply nudging only when I have concrete, uh, fundamental kind of knowledge of whom to nudge, in which way. And even like in our study, we found that it's way more potential to work with stores and home appliances rather than nudging individuals. So uh, we decided to a bit um, not be in rush about nudging, but definitely it's a very organic prolongation uh, to continue research uh, behavioral strategies to model them first, because I really very careful with interacting with end users, especially after writing ethical approval, which is like 100 pages. <laughs> you, believe me, I'm very careful with uh, penetrating people's everyday life. And mm, I think that nudging should come uh, after a pretty well done study with a clear uh, behavioral modeling first, and then just do it in the, in the life. Sorry if I disappoint you, uh, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Um, and now I had a, a question for Kurt, because uh, he, during his presentation, he showed how, um, yes, how uh, these uh, competitive uh, auctioning tenders, uh, um, especially if, um, um, they uh, are for large enterprises. So how do you, how can behavior economics helps, including SME, for example, in competitive auctionings, how can they include them? Um, thanks. That's uh, a question we really should study systematically once. Um, we discussed a little bit. We have, uh, it's just one, one thing, uh, a finding from a survey that was done with enterprises. They showed um, a lot of enterprises who never engaged with the scheme. They think it's difficult and complicated and hesitate. And um, those who um, participated once, only a minor part still thinks it's complicated. Um, there's a sort of threshold. Um, you have to get people to try it once and you should invest into the, the image of the scheme so people don't think, oh no, I heard about it, but it's people say it's difficult or it's complicated. You should also um, um, try to give it a good um, image that it's something it's a little bit competitive but it can be fun and very rewarding if you succeed and it's easy to participate it's not um, it doesn't cost you much try and we are here for you to help you to get into it it's just one thing we were thinking about uh, but still um, there's no systematic um, thinking about um, how to improve it through behavioral economics. Okay, thank you very much. Our time is uh, now is uh, nearly finished. I want to thank you all of you and all the participants because uh, through your stories, I began introducing you that there is a network of stories and many different stories need to be told. I appreciated very much your stories. I hope that the audience too. And um, I think uh, that uh, even if there is a, still a long path to um, energy transition, but we are on this, uh, we are on the right way. So thank you very much. And uh, I hope to see you tomorrow for uh, another session, the last day of uh, BEHAVE conference. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.